Hi everyone, and welcome back to Inside Tech. The new 2019 iPhone lineup is finally here, and along with their release came a great weight of expectation. With the fantastic developments we've seen in Android smartphones this year, it's no secret that Apple have been playing catch-up. But with some surprising and innovative improvements, the iPhone is back competing with the best on the market. A lot of the experience you get with the new phones will feel familiar. The notch design is still here, and it's starting to show its age. But some big increases to battery life and significantly improved cameras have given us a reason to be excited about iPhone once again. This video will cover everything that's new this year, the differences between each model, whether or not you should upgrade, and of course which iPhone offers the best value for money. Let's take a look. The three new iPhones are direct successors to previous models. We have the iPhone 11 replacing the cheaper XR, the 11 Pro replacing the XS, and the 11 Pro Max replacing the XS Max. The new naming system has been simplified and is an improvement on last year, but still could do with some work. The use of the term Pro, for example, could be a little controversial, as we'll see throughout this video. I also think that we should just have the iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pro, and then differentiate between the two Pro models simply by size. This would make things a lot easier, especially since the two Pros are essentially the same phone, but in different sizes. Apple already uses this system with its MacBook and iPad lineups, so it would make sense here too. The iPhone 11 has the same form factor as the XR, right down to the very same size and weight. It's still a glass sandwich with an aluminium frame, and with no change to the front design, you wouldn't be able to tell the two apart just by looking. The rear panel has seen some changes though with a new dual lens camera module. The square camera bump has a frosted texture to contrast from the glossy back, the iPhone branding has been removed, and the Apple logo is now centered to take into account the larger camera module. These changes do give the iPhone a cleaner look, but depending on your region, you may still find some safety stamps at the bottom. Water resistance has now been improved to IP68, to protect the phone against submersion at up to 2 meters for 30 minutes, twice the depth of the iPhone XR. The phone is available in six new pastel colors, in contrast to the bolder colors of the XR. The Pro models also follow a similar design from last year's models, but are actually a little bit bigger, thicker, and heavier than their predecessors. The increase in thickness is largely due to the new bigger batteries, which marks a rare change in Apple's approach, in which function has been prioritized over style. Again, we have a glass sandwich design, but the Pro models have a stronger stainless steel frame versus the aluminium frame in the iPhone 11, and the majority of other smartphones too. Stainless steel is much harder than aluminium, so will offer better scratch resistance. The rear panels are sporting the new triple lens camera system, and now have frosted glass backs with glossy camera modules, the reverse of the iPhone 11. I personally much prefer the Pro's design over the iPhone 11. The matte texture to the glass feels really good in the hand, and is much more resistant to fingerprints. As you've likely already noticed, there's a new colour option with the Pro models in addition to the gold, silver and space grey from last year. The new midnight green is only subtly different from space grey, and is far less obviously green than pictures would initially suggest. Its stainless steel border is colour matched too, but only in certain lights will you be able to see the difference from the space grey model. The Pros also have improved water resistance, again with an IP68 rating, but have actually been tested to a depth of 4 meters as opposed to 2, awarding the 11 Pros the best water resistance for any smartphone. Despite not having an increase in thickness, the iPhone 11 receives a slightly larger battery than the XR, but it's mainly due to optimizations with the new processor that enable the phone to extend its battery life by one hour. The XR already had fantastic battery life, the best of last year's iPhones, so to extend this even further is great to see. The Pros on the other hand take this a whole lot further, with significantly larger batteries than their predecessors. The 11 Pro lasts 4 hours longer than the XS, and the 11 Pro Max lasts 5 hours longer than the XS Max, which are absolutely huge gains in battery life. Finally, iPhone users have been given what they've been asking for for years, sacrificing a bit in terms of the phone's thickness to give much better battery life. The Pro models also finally have the fast chargers included in the box, something Apple already should have been doing for years, but it's great to see them finally make this change. The 18 watt adapter has a USB-C connector, and a USB-C to lightning cable is included too. Unfortunately, Apple didn't make the full switch to USB-C, despite the fact that they've been using USB-C in their iPad Pros. So given that they've also called these phones Pro, I would have thought that we'd see USB-C here too. It's likely we'll need to wait for next year's iPhones to finally ditch the lightning port, but including USB-C fast chargers in the box is at least a step in the right direction. The cheaper iPhone 11 doesn't receive the fast charger in the box, and instead comes with a standard 5 watt adapter. All three phones are capable of fast charging though, and using the 18 watt charger, I was able to charge the iPhone 11 in 2 hours and 12 minutes, the 11 Pro in 1 hour 40 minutes, and the 11 Pro Max in 2 hours and 1 minute. 
Fast charging provides 50% battery after just 30 minutes of charging, but the 18 watt speed does pale in comparison to the competition, with speeds now up to and even exceeding 45 watts. The phone supports Qi wireless charging at 7.5 watts, but again, this is starting to fall behind the competition, with speeds up to 4 times faster now becoming available. The iPhone 11 has the exact same 6.1 inch liquid retina display as the XR. It's an LCD display with a resolution that doesn't quite reach 1080p, which by 2019 standards is lacking behind the competition. Samsung's Galaxy S10e, for example, widely considered to be the equivalent to this phone, has a much better 1080p AMOLED display. The bezels on the iPhone 11 are also pretty thick, especially by today's standards. I should say though that I am approaching this as a tech reviewer, as the majority of people considering this phone really won't care too much about the specs. The iPhone 11's display is still very sharp, has beautiful colours, and is still a big improvement from many of the older generation iPhones. The iPhone 11 Pros, by contrast, have far superior OLED displays. The bezels are noticeably thinner on the Pro models, but it's the true blacks and bright whites that really separate the two displays. With iOS 13 introducing dark mode, you can only fully appreciate this on the OLED displays of the Pro models. The deep blacks are really striking, and of course more battery efficient too. The Pros have improved displays from the 10s models of last year, and now have much higher brightness and contrast ratios. Apple have dubbed the displays Super Retina XDR, since they borrow elements from the upcoming Pro Display XDR, which I'd imagine is part of how Apple want to justify the term Pro in the phone's name. As good as these displays are though, I really think that these should have had the 120Hz refresh rate that we've seen in the iPad Pros, and therefore calling them Pro would have at least made a bit more sense. The increased brightness now peaks at 800 nits under normal use, which makes for fantastic viewing in bright conditions, but the screen actually maxes out at 1200 nits when viewing high dynamic range content, and this is where the displays really shine. You can notice the improved brightness over last year's 10s models, but for me, it's really the improved contrast ratio that stands out. Despite the increased brightness, the displays are actually 15% more efficient, so your content looks even better without sacrificing on battery life. One potential downgrade here though, is that the phones no longer support 3D touch, which has been replaced by haptic touch instead. This is a feature we expected to see removed, and is something you'll eventually learn to adjust to, but I did miss how much faster 3D touch is on the XS Max. Content on these displays does look absolutely stunning, and on the Pro Max's 6.5 inch display especially, but with new spatial audio, it sounds better too. The speakers on these phones are noticeably louder, and with higher audio quality, and the spatial audio with Dolby Atmos support can give you a really immersive experience when watching movies. As great as these displays are though, the one major thing I just can't overlook is the large and obtrusive notch. The once innovative notch display now looks very outdated by what other smartphones are offering today, be it smaller hole punch cutouts or entire screen displays with pop-up cameras. The front appearance of Apple's iPhone hasn't changed in two years, and I can completely understand anybody wanted to hold off upgrading until the rumoured redesign of the 2020 iPhone. As convenient as Face ID is, I would definitely take an under-display fingerprint scanner in order to shrink the notch down to just the front-facing camera lens. Speaking of Face ID, this is now said to be 30% faster. Confusingly, Apple have also stated that the speed boost is due to improvements within iOS 13, so I tested the unlock speed on the 11 Pro Max against last year's XS Max on both iOS 12 and 13. Running iOS 12, the XS Max is noticeably slower than the 11 Pro Max, but updated to iOS 13, there was essentially no difference at all, so the faster Face ID is simply due to iOS optimizations and not the new phones themselves. Face ID is also supposed to work at more angles, but from my testing with tilting and rotations, there doesn't seem to have been any improvement at all. Still, the speed boost is a welcome change, especially since Face ID was previously slower than most unlock methods like fingerprint sensors. What's also packed inside iPhone's notch is the front-facing True Depth camera. This has a 12 megapixel sensor with next-gen Smart HDR, improved from the 7 megapixel sensor of the previous generation. The difference in image quality from last year is quite striking. Images are brighter and much sharper than before. You can see here just how much more detail the 11 Pro Max is able to capture. Portrait mode photos now look even better too, and I think that the depth perception does appear to have been improved on the new phones. When using the front facing camera, you can now tap to expand the field of view to get a little bit extra into the frame, and the phone will actually do this for you if you rotate it to landscape. Another new feature here is quick take video, where if you hold down the shutter button, the phone will automatically switch from photo mode and start recording video, and you can then swipe to the right to lock in video recording. In previous years, pressing and holding the shutter button would take burst photos instead, so to do this on the new phones, you now drag the shutter button to the left. Video has also been improved to now support 4K recording at 60 frames per second, awarding iPhone the highest quality front-facing video for any smartphone. The cinematic stabilisation is now supported at 4K too, and the difference in video quality from last year's models is very apparent. 
I also noticed that the video isn't as cropped in on the new phones, so you can fit more into the frame, even when recording video. Slow motion video is now supported on the front camera too, which Apple have said will allow you to take slow fees. It's a ridiculous name, and honestly, I can't ever see slow motion video on the front facing camera ever being useful in real world applications, but it's there if you want it. The biggest changes with the new iPhones come with the improved rear facing cameras. The ultra wide lens is the most notable new addition, and something that fans have been asking for for some time now. This means that the iPhone 11 now has 12 megapixel main and ultra wide lenses, marking a departure from the main and telephoto setup we've seen in previous dual lens iPhones. For me personally, the pairing of the main and ultra wide lens is by far the better choice. I can't say I ever really used the telephoto lens in the past, whereas the ultra wide lens offers a completely different type of photo, and is something I'd use more often. If you do want a telephoto lens though, then you'll need to get one of the 11 Pro models instead, which have all three lenses. The Pro's telephoto lens is actually improved from last year, now with a wider aperture for better low light photography. What surprised me was just how fluidly the phone switched between the three lenses, which is even possible whilst recording video. Using the zoom wheel, you can notice as the lens switches over, but the transition is pretty smooth and doesn't stutter, as we've seen in some other smartphones. Another nice feature is that the phone intelligently adapts to the environment to suggest when the ultra wide lens might be useful, and will display a transparent image of how much extra you could fit into the frame if you switch to the ultra wide lens. These suggestions appear when viewing scenes such as landscapes, and you can see as I move a subject into focus, like these AirPods, that the phone fades out the ultra wide preview and the borders turn to black. As I remove the AirPods, the landscape scene comes back into frame and the transparent preview returns. The animations for squeezing the previews into frame as you switch lenses are pretty smooth, and you can see that you can also get a main lens preview when viewing the telephoto lens. There have also been improvements to dynamic range with next-gen Smart HDR, to give enhanced highlights and shadow details. We should see this taken even further over the coming months as Apple releases Deep Fusion, a new technology for enhanced image processing that optimises textures, details and noise across the entire image. The feature sounds impressive, so it'll be interesting to see how well this works. The full range of portrait effects are now available to all three phones, but what's great about the Pro models is that you can now choose whether to use portrait mode with the main or telephoto lens, where in previous years this was locked to the telephoto lens only. The iPhone has one of the best portrait modes of any smartphone, images are sharp and detailed, and the edge detection with both cameras is very good. The cameras have also been upgraded to finally include a dedicated night mode. Even in the darkest of conditions, the phones do a great job of exposing your images whilst retaining a decent amount of detail. From my testing so far, this is one of the better night modes that I've used, possibly even the best, so it'll be interesting to see how this compares to the Google Pixel 4 in a couple of weeks. Looking at these images here, you can see how using night mode I was able to capture details in the roof that were completely missing in the other image. You have control over the shutter speed, so you can customise how much light you want the phone to take in, and this allows you to take long exposures to produce images like this. This was taken in almost pitch black conditions, and to give you an idea of context, this is how the image looked with night mode turned off. One area where the iPhone has dominated the industry is in video recording, and Apple have taken this even further with the new iPhones. Extended dynamic range is now supported up to 60 frames per second. The new video editor is extremely comprehensive thanks to iOS 13, as there are new features like audio zoom, which I'll be testing against the Galaxy Note 10 Plus in my next video. But it's the high bitrate and image stabilisation that really puts iPhone ahead of the rest. This 4K 60 frames per second clip was taken whilst walking, with the phone held relaxed in my hand, and the iPhone's smooth video recording is simply peerless. The camera improvements are a welcome addition to the new phones, even if some of those were long overdue. It's really great to see that the upgrades aren't just reserved for the Pro models. The iPhone 11 has the exact same cameras, performance and features with the exception of the telephoto lens. The camera model may have a controversial design, but the great performance means that the iPhone now, once again, has one of the best cameras on a smartphone. As usual, we see some performance gains with Apple's new A13 Bionic chip, which is the fastest CPU in any smartphone. The CPU is said to be 20% faster and 30% more efficient than its predecessor, and the GPU is 20% faster and 40% more efficient. Last year's A12 Bionic was already an incredibly powerful chip, and you'll probably only see a slight speed improvement with general use, but the power enhancements allow the phone to process those new camera features. Smart HDR and extended dynamic range, the seamless blending of multiple exposures from the triple camera system, and simultaneous 4K60 recording from multiple lenses. Whilst the CPU carries out its 1 trillion operations per second behind the scenes, what you'll really notice is the vastly improved efficiency, and despite the phone's higher processing power, the improvements to battery life are perhaps the best new feature this year. Even with moderate to high use, I was often exceeding 10 hours of screen on time, which easily competes with the best Android smartphones. I found myself charging the phones every couple of days as opposed to every night, and the improved battery life is one of the most noticeable and significant improvements from previous models. 
Apple have also designed a new U1 chip, which allows the phone to use ultra-wideband technology for spatial awareness. This will allow iPhone to utilise applications with precise location tracking, the full potential of which we'll see unlocked in the future. For now though, you can use the chip for priority file sharing and airdrop. Simply by pointing your phone towards another device, you can highlight your target receiver for faster file transfers. One other thing I feel is important to mention is that Apple have taken further steps to reduce their environmental impact by including 100% recycled tin in the logic board and 100% recycled rare earth metals in the Taptic engine, the first smartphone ever to do so. Of course there's always more they could be doing, but I think it's important to recognise and acknowledge this kind of positive action. Now when it comes to the price, we are dealing with flagship smartphones and prices are accordingly very high. But Apple surprised everyone by announcing that the iPhone 11 would retail at $699, $50 cheaper than last year's iPhone XR. The 11 is a significant improvement over the XR, so to lower the price this year was a surprising but pleasing move from Apple. The Pro models, as expected, retail for the same price as last year's phones, at $999 and $1099 respectively. It's bad news for UK fans though, since Apple have had to increase the UK prices due to the current political uncertainty. This isn't Apple's fault at all, but something to note for those looking to buy in the UK. One thing that definitely is Apple's fault though, is still having just 64GB of storage in the baseline models. Yes, cloud storage is now fairly cheap and readily available, but 64GB is one of the lowest storage options on the market, and leaves Apple far behind the competition. I really think that Apple should have at least doubled the storage, and I can't help but feel as though this was a missed opportunity. In terms of deciding between the phones, the pros are separated from the 11 in four main areas. The design, the display, battery life, and the telephoto lens. The telephoto lens is definitely not a priority for me, and the battery life on the 11 is already so good that I wouldn't feel compelled to upgrade to a Pro. But having experienced the true blacks offered by OLED, the Pro's XDR displays are very tempting, not to mention the feel of those frosted glass backs and the added durability of the stainless steel frames. Whether or not you think these extras justify the higher price tags is up to you, but I personally think that the iPhone 11 offers by far the best value for money, and is the phone that most people should buy. Obviously, all three of these phones are very expensive, but the iPhone 11 is offering a whole lot of phone at under $700. As for deciding between the 11 Pro and Pro Max, Apple makes this choice a lot easier since these are the same phones, just with different screen sizes and a slightly better battery life on the Pro Max. Photographers and movie watchers might want to consider the Pro Max, since viewing content on the larger 6.5 inch display is really enjoyable, but the form factor and one-handed use benefits that the 11 Pro offer are pretty compelling too. Should you upgrade from last year's phones? No, but an annual phone refresh seldom justifies this kind of upgrade. As tempting as the new features are, it's probably not quite worth the money if you win a 10R, 10S, or 10S Max. For those with an iPhone 8 or older though, now might be a good time to upgrade, since you can benefit from improvements from the past two years like Face ID, thinner bezels, and the gorgeous OLED displays. For those who can't look past Apple's aging notch design though, you'll probably want to hold off for another year for a significant redesign that some would argue is long overdue. 5G hasn't yet arrived to the iPhone, and realistically the world isn't ready for the technology anyway. But for those who would hang on to their phone for 4 or 5 years, you should also consider waiting for Apple to launch their 5G phones. The iPhone 11 lineup builds on the foundation set by last year's phones, and you get the sense that Apple have pushed the iPhone to its maximum potential before the major redesign we're expecting to see next year. A complete camera overhaul and significantly improved battery life are exactly what the iPhone needed, and in fairness to Apple, these are areas in which they've absolutely delivered. There's clearly room for improvement here but the 2019 iPhones mark a significant step not only in catching up with the best Android smartphones, but in some areas, exceeding them too. For everything that Apple still leaves to be desired, changes like including the fast chargers inside the Pro boxes, their push to use more recyclable materials, and releasing thicker iPhones with bigger batteries shows that they're taking steps in the right direction, even if they're still not convinced you just yet. This year's iPhone lineup certainly feels more exciting than this time last year, so for those who've held off upgrading, now could be the time to make that change. But what do you guys think about these phones? Do they offer enough to warrant an upgrade, and which of the three do you think offers the best value for money? Let me know in the comments which one of these you'll be buying, and if you found this video helpful at all, then please show your support by giving this a thumbs up. I'll have a review of the Apple Watch Series 5, and a comparison of the iPhone 11 Pro Max versus the Samsung Galaxy Note 10 Plus coming up on the channel very soon. So if you want to see those videos, then make sure you're subscribed with notifications turned on so that you're notified when those videos go live. You can also find the channel on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at Inside Tech Limited for all of the latest news and some extra content too. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.